Uh, Carolyn, if you want to start recording, you can do that now. Uh, welcome everybody to the January 5th and Avon CAC meeting. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with Emergency Ordinance 20 TAC Alpha 16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. The committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are myself, Greg Roller, David Storm, Sean Bridge, Roger Hickadance, Karen Davenport, Tom Thorpe, Mary Catherine King, Diane Greider, and Robert Finley. Staff members who are present include Lance Stewart, Donna Price, Tori Kanopoulos, Carolyn Schaefer, Karen Firehawk, and Greg Harper. The opportunities for the public to access and participate in this electronic meeting are posted in the Almaro County, and the persons responsible for receiving public comment are the 5th and Avon Community Advisory Committee. I sent out the minutes on uh, Monday or Tuesday, David uh, proposed two corrections that I don't think anybody will have uh, any problems with. One is changing uh, Rick Randolph's name from Rack to Rick. Uh, Rick, I suspect you'll appreciate that. And the second correction is changing us from a CAC, from a CIC to a CAC. Uh, I think nobody is likely to have any problems with that either. Uh, I propose that we accept those changes. Great, I saw a, a couple of hands. I'm going to take that as a seconded. Are there any other changes that anybody had identified? No. Sorry, Karen, is that? Well, they're just typos on that same page, but nothing. Up okay. There. I propose we approve the minutes. All right, seconded by Craig. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the next item on our agenda is the officer elections. Uh, we discussed this briefly during our last meeting in November. Um, I'm willing to stay and do this for another year, although I'm certainly willing to give it up if anybody wants to take it. Uh, and MK has indicated she's willing to stay in her current role as well. And, uh, and Craig indicated that earlier this evening. That said, I think all three of us would be delighted if somebody wanted those roles. Uh, so with that preamble, I'm gonna turn it over to Tori uh, to conduct our officer elections for the upcoming year. Sure, so even if um, everyone who's in their current roles would like to stay in those roles, we do still need to do the formal nominating and voting. Um, but before we do that, is there anyone else who's interested in chair, vice chair, or secretary that's not currently in one of those roles? Don't see anyone who is. <laughs> In that case, um, do we have a nomination for um, James to remain as chair? And as uh, this, is, this is Sean Bridge. I nominate the existing um, slate to be continued for another term. This is Rob Finley. I second the motion. I think we could do everyone together like that. Um, can we go ahead and have the vote then for um, all three current members to remain in their current positions? Okay. Yes, this is Diane. I can't get my picture to come up, I'm sorry. I don't know. No why. problem. <laughs> um, all right, well with that, we'll close the vote and everyone will remain in their current positions. So thanks everyone. Thanks, that's, uh, that's not necessarily the outcome I was hoping for, but uh, I'm delighted to do it. <laughs> You're doing such a good job. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm glad we handled the, uh, the official business pretty quickly. Uh, and with that, the next item on our agenda is the Climate Action Plan Overview. Uh, Greg and Lance, over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be sharing my screen here. And um, please let me know if it works, if you can see the presentation. Look good. OK, thank you. Um, my name is Greg Harper, Chief of Environmental Services at the county. Um, we appreciate your interest in the Climate Action Plan. And uh, thank you for your invitation to present this evening. Uh, and as uh, James noted, Lance Stewart, uh, the Director of the Facilities and Environmental Services Department is with us and will be available to help answer questions at the end. Um, 
So in this presentation, I'm going to provide a little background. I'm going to review the main contents of the Climate Action Plan and some examples of goals and actions and uh, preview the elements, some of which we've already started, of the next phase of the climate program. And then we'll have time for questions at the end, as I said. Um, the climate action planning process was initiated by the board through the adoption of a resolution reaffirming a commitment to climate action in September of 2017, followed by identifying climate action planning as a top priority of, the, of, the, of part of the fiscal year 2022 strategic plan. More recently, the board adopted a resolution establishing community-wide greenhouse gas reduction targets, including a 45% reduction from the 2008 baseline year by 2030 and zero net emissions by 2050. We haven't completed a greenhouse gas inventory since 2008, so our current emission status and therefore the necessary reductions to meet the targets is unknown. However, we have begun the process of developing a current inventory and expect this to be completed um, by uh, probably the end of next month. Um, the climate action plan is the culmination of an extensive effort by many people. Since this is a community-wide plan, the planning process necessarily included substantial input from the community through participation on the sector teams, developing the strategies and actions, and through providing feedback by attending public meetings, also by filling out online questionnaires, and by sending letters and emails to board members and county staff directly. The list of strategies and actions that make up the heart of this plan were developed from ideas suggested by the community and vetted, refined, and organized by members of the sector teams themselves, including community representation. Early this year, uh, or early, I should say, last year, um, staff prepared the draft climate action plan document, adding context, character, and spirit to the list of strategies and actions. Due to the emergence of the coronavirus, we were delayed in presenting the plan to the board as we originally planned, and instead introduced the plan first to the community in April and May of last year, inviting feedback via the county's community engagement hub, public input. We then presented the same draft plan to the board in June. Since that time, um, we've been um, uh, incorporating the suggestions received from the board and community into the present version of the plan. Now I'd like to summarize the plan. Um, at its most reductive level, the plan is a list of strategies and actions designed to contribute towards the mitigation of global climate change through decreases in community-wide greenhouse gas emissions and increases in carbon sequestration in the county landscape. The strategies and actions will guide future county initiatives not only to, um, to modify internal operations, but to work with our partners to enable, empower, and incentivize residents and businesses in the community to take climate positive actions. Looking at the numbers, the Climate Action Plan consists of 11 broad goals and five action sectors designed to meet the long-term emission reduction targets adopted by the board a year ago. Uh, 31 strategies have been identified to achieve the goals and 135 actions, which are a bit more specific, support the strategies. For each of the actions, we proposed an, an implementation timeframe. Immediately actionable items are those that are already underway or can be implemented in a relatively short period of time with existing resources. Initiate planning items are those that we can bring to, to um, we can begin to plan, excuse me, but will take more time and may require greater financial investments. And items identified as assess opportunities are the most indefinite and will require further exploration. And some of these may not be possible unless opportunities arise. Although the strategies and actions are central to the plan, we hope people regard the climate action plan as more than just a simple to-do list. The plan was, as the broader climate action program will be, developed and implemented in line with the county's core values and overall vision for the community. We recognize that there is no merit in actions that may lower greenhouse gas emissions, but only at the expense of other community values, such as equity or the economy. On the contrary, climate positive actions can and should uplift the community in other ways, including those listed here. We recognize that this plan echoes many of the same values and broad aspirations identified by other county and regional plans, most prominently the comprehensive plan. 
these other plans should and do overlap with the climate action plan in countless ways. Continued work to implement components of the other plans will in many cases contribute towards climate mitigation. Conversely, the implementation of the actions in this climate action plan will push the county towards reaching the other plan's goals. Climate change is a complex global challenge, the ultimate example of a tragedy of the commons. This challenge can be addressed only through shared understanding, relying on the world's subject matter experts and collective action starting at the local level. The board acted in this cooperative spirit as recently as a year ago when it called on the Virginia General Assembly to support climate friendly policies as a member of the We Are Still In Coalition. I touched on this idea a, min a minute ago that it would be careless to measure actions only in their capacity to lower greenhouse gas emissions and without consideration of their impact on other community values. We commit to avoiding this narrow assessment termed carbon reductionism and we'll consider planning and implementation efforts taking into account the overall well being of our community, the economy, and the environment. Although this first phase of climate action planning did not include quantitative assessments nor measurable goals at the action level, we recognize that effective plans overall must have targets to aim for and methods to measure progress and success along the way. As mentioned earlier, the board adopted greenhouse gas emission reduction targets um, over a year ago, with the first target just 10 years away. And to measure our progress, we are committed to conducting greenhouse gas inventories every two years, beginning now. Um, as with any complex long-term initiative, this climate action planning process will be phased and adaptive. This is particularly necessary in the case of climate action due to the scope and complexity of the challenge developing technologies, politics, and the need for global collective action. During phase one, our focus had been raising community awareness, engaging with partners, and seeking community participation to establish rudimentary strategies and actions. Um, subsequent phases, which we've already begun, will build on this foundation with a significant shift from simply planning to a lot of doing. And I'll summarize phase two work more in just a few minutes. At every opportunity, we will adjust our course as needed based on our progress and shifting local, national, and global conditions. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of the five sectors that are, are, um, that are the, the main sectors from which uh, emissions are, are driven. Transportation produces almost 50% of total greenhouse gas emissions within the county, according to the 2008 inventory. And land use is included in this sector because land use has a significant effect on people's options for getting around, of course. The goals for this sector are reducing overall vehicle miles traveled and shifting towards more efficient modes of transportation. The heating, cooling, and powering of buildings is also a significant generator of greenhouse gases locally, about 45% of emissions based on the 20, 2008 inventory. Major goals included reducing overall energy use in buildings and increasing on-site renewable energy production. Renewable energy sourcing means generating renewable energy locally to displace the need for importing energy generated elsewhere that likely comes from burning fossil fuels. Note that this sector is different from the renewable energy we described in the building sector um, that might be located on a building rooftop to serve that building. These are projects that are intended to generate electricity to be sold on the electric grid system. You could also think of the difference between buildings and renewable energy sourcing in terms of whether the energy generation occurs on the building side of the meter or the grid side of the meter. The fourth uh, sector is sustainable materials management. And these goals are intended to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the decomposition of organic waste and the life cycle of products. These goals in include increasing the amount of recyclable materials put to positive use and diverting uh, from the landfill and diverted from the landfill and composting organic materials instead of landfilling them. Like renewable energy sourcing, the landscape, natural resources, and agricultural sector is more about offsetting greenhouse gas emissions, in this case, primarily by capturing and trapping carbon in vegetation, the soil, and products like timber. The major goals in this sector include protecting and restoring natural carbon sinks and promoting practices on managed land that trap carbon and minimize emissions. 
As an example of an immediately actionable item is uh, increase public information about bicycle and pedestrian safety. I think it's obvious that this action would not require a great amount of staff time, nor would it cost very much money. Therefore, this could be implemented relatively quickly. An example of an item in which we would initiate planning is increase availability of electric vehicle infrastructure on government pro properties. We could begin progress on this action very quickly, but it would take a little bit longer to bring to fruition and we would require some funding as well. An example of an item in which we would assess opportunities is increase affordable housing options in areas served by a variety of transportation options. This isn't something the county could simply do on its own, and it would involve partners or planners and community development, for instance, working with developers and other stakeholders during the master planning process or during the review of projects requiring special use permits or rezonings. Uh, in order to identify uh, possibilities and to work towards making the possibility a reality. So this action would be implemented over a long term and might require some additional data and our processes um, to be first developed to ensure opportunities don't get missed. Before we conclude the presentation, I'd like to preview the next phase of climate action work. As the title suggests, we're looking forward to transitioning from plan development to an emphasis on implementation of actions. If you recall from an earlier slide, there are 36 immediately actionable items alone in the plan. We will continue our progress with the items that are already underway, such as supporting LEAPS home energy efficiency programs and exploring ways to improve trash and recycling operations and services. In addition, we've already gotten started with some new actions. We're actually in the process right now of executing an agreement with the Albemarle Housing Improvement Play Program to support home energy improvements for low-income residents. And we've applied for funding to support the installation of a number of electric vehicle charging stations for the public um, at our two county office buildings. And we're supporting outreach and education programs administered by the local planning or by local planning, uh, excuse me, local partner organizations, including climate action kits for public school students and the Better Business Challenge. Implementation will require resources, funding, and our staffing, and we will begin work to identify these needs and possible ways to meet the needs. We will also ensure that there is a responsible party to champion each action. We are, as I said, we are well into the process of developing a current greenhouse gas inventory and intend to have completed this inventory sometime in the next couple of months, as I said before. Um, we're also involved, along with the city and UVA right now, with an extensive training session for a new inventory component that will enable us to account for the carbon effect of forests and trees throughout our landscape. Um, also, environmental services staff have already had a number of discussions with um, other county staff, including those from the fire rescues, community risk and resiliency section, to begin getting organized around developing a climate resiliency plan. <clears throat> like the climate action plan, we expect, expect this initiative to involve many county staff and include extensive community involvement. Of course, we're not going to actually turn our backs on the plan itself. I've described our intent in phase two to more completely evaluate every strategy and action in order to determine which ones are most cost effective in reducing greenhouse gas emissions or could contribute the most towards advancing our county goals, including equity. This evaluation will enable us to be more specific and time bound in revising the actions. Lastly, we will continue to engage with the community to promote climate awareness and individual actions and to boost the community's involvement with the county's climate action processes. Climate action plan represents Albemarle County's commitment to be part of the collective action necessary to address global climate change. The plan acknowledges the importance of changing the way we do business and the way we live our lives, but also recognizes that climate positive changes don't have to happen through personal and economic sacrifices. They can actually help to bring about the types of community we envision and desire, one with abundant resources, healthy ecosystems, vib vibrant development areas, a physical environment that supports healthy lifestyles, a thriving economy, and exceptional educational opp opportunities. In adopting this plan, the county will be joining many other governments and businesses around the world in building an equitable, clean, and prosperous future. 
If you're interested, you could read the plan and stay up to date with what's happening at the county's website at this web, web address. That is um, the formal presentation. And as I said, uh, I'm on board and Lance is here too to answer any questions you might have about the plan. And I will stop sharing, I guess. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate it. Uh, and just as a reminder for everybody, the way we'll, uh, we'll handle questions, if you can electronically raise your hand, I will acknowledge them in the, the order that I see them. And while we're uh, sort of thinking of our questions, I've got a, a, a kickoff question for you, Greg. When you talked about the greenhouse gas inventories, I, could you tell us a little bit more about how that's done? And I, my presumption is one measure is vehicle miles traveled and you're working with VDOT to get those. Are you taking into account that travel this year is probably fairly suppressed off of a normal year? Uh, I just, I'm concerned that our baseline might be a little bit lower than we would expect otherwise. Actually, uh, the first uh, point I would make is that the inventory we're doing right now is, uh, is, is really a 2018 inventory based on 2018 activity data. And it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit delayed like it is because it's, um, we can't get 2020 data right now um, because it, it just takes a while for the institutions who give us that data to develop them. So uh, we're doing a 2018 inventory and, um, and yes, they're, they're based on really two things. One is um, activities. We, you mentioned vehicle miles traveled. That's, that's a, the major activity, of course, in the transportation category. And then an, an example of activity in the building category would be, of course, electricity used. Um, so we get that data from a variety of sources. And then we basically convert the activity data into um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the form of CO2 or equivalent CO2 um, by using um, you know, conversion factors that are provided um, by the, the climate scientists of the world, basically. So vehicle miles traveled um, times uh, the efficiency or the conversion factor, and then you get basically um, the CO2 equivalent out of that. And what we're seeing is like um, over time, you know, we're seeing activity increase because more people live here, more, more miles probably are going to be traveled every year in some form or another, but um, the efficiency of vehicles is actually increasing. So we're seeing a little bit of a decline in emissions um, in net. So that's, that's generally the trend we've been seeing. And I think that'll continue, especially as we transition from, you know, heavy gas burning vehicles to smaller, hopefully electric vehicles. I don't know if I answered all your questions. I, I do think that when we get around to 2020 uh, numbers, which will be in a couple of years, um, we we'll probably will see a, a you know, a, a significant drop, a drop we can actually notice in uh, activities of sorts. And then, um, but that's probably gonna be temporary and it'll probably just bump right back up in, a, in like next year or this year or something like that. And I'll add James, um, maybe not. Um, you know, I think certainly the community uh, and Albemarle County local government certainly are learning that, um, you know, teleworking is a, is a fantastic opportunity in, in many ways. And it's something that we can promote, which was not something when, when our groups um, of, of volunteers and staff were working through, uh, you know, our concepts really imagine that we would, you know, be able to say, oh, Okay, well, you know, 30% of the, you know, workforce driving into town every day should just stop and, and uh, you know, do Zoom meetings, which was not something we conceived. So I think promotion of that uh, is, I think that's going to happen on its own, but I think it's also, um, you know, something, something that we can engage in, in terms of promoting the benefits of uh, and, and committing as an institution, certainly to realize the benefits of. Great, thank you for that, uh, that thorough answer. And then David, I think I saw your hand next. Thank you, and Lance, actually, I appreciate that comment about working from home because I was, uh, wanted to go into something that I wanted to ask about. Um, because when we talk about working from home, we do see that reduction in, in vehicle miles traveled, but what we're not picking up necessarily is just the shift of where that carbon burden becomes. Um, 
homes in the county, especially in this, the two districts we're talking about here, um, there, were, there are a number of older homes where the energy efficiency of those homes is worse than um, any of the office buildings that people may have been in. And second, with the added burden of increased usage of internet, um, you find that we need to have you know, Amazon server farms and those types of things, which become huge users of electricity. And basically what we're seeing is a shift really in where that carbon usage and that CO2 um, and those greenhouse gases are generated. Um, so how do we adjust for that? My second question is, um, is there a natural tension within the county between this climate action plan and what we're seeing from the Economic uh, Development Authority in terms of reaching out, trying, and, and I'm going to use the example of the Elmore Business Campus to generate a new um, office construction space and a new self-storage construction space and some, some non-class A office space um, when we're trying to reduce our, our carbon footprint in this way. David, I don't know if you expected me to have an answer to that. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let everybody take their best shots at it. We've got some elected officials here. We've got other appointed officials here. Um, I, I just, I just want to know that you know, it's, it, it's a great idea, but, but there are some tensions that, that have to be resolved here. And I don't know where, you know, I, I, we want to try and accomplish all of them. That's great. But, but is there a tension and how are we thinking about addressing it? I mean, I think there absolutely is. Um, you know, three years ago, when our team um, was, you know, planning the climate action planning process, we we looked at a, um, dozens of other uh, city and county climate action plans and and how they assess those. And there were a number of them that that really set their goals instead instead of on like ultimate outcome, like absolute reduction. Um, Set, set those goals uh, based on a per capita basis. So it, that, that sort of accounted for growth. It, it, it said in a way, we recognize that one of our goals is that, that we intend as a community to grow smartly, um, but we want to work within that um, to, to, to reduce our, our carbon footprint you know, per person, uh, per square foot, if you will. And, and we often think that way and local government in terms of our buildings, because we know that over time we may need to add police stations or fire stations. And every one of those decisions that we make about uh, our buildings or our, the, the count of our, our, our fleet and our, our general footprint are, are, you know, do come with choices. And I think, um, you know, as staff, when we make recommendations and certainly as board members, as they make decisions, you know, have to recognize that, that every, growth related decision that they make has um, an, an impact that has to be considered. And, and I know that um, uh, Supervisor uh, Palmer and, um, and the rest of the board uh, are, are very aware of that. Uh, Mr. Randolph is, as well, that that is, um, that there is tension there and it's difficult to manage. And um, I, I don't think that we have a, you know, a, a clear path forward, but, you know, I, I really think that this, um, um, group of folks is, is a great way for us to kind of explore that uh, because, you know, a, a big part of what you all do are related to, you know, to land use and the decisions that communities and local government make. And, you know, other than to answer questions, uh, the main reason that I'm here tonight is really to hear your perspective and how that might inform uh, how we think and what we do. I wasn't trying to pick on you specifically. It was just that yours was a segue into my question. So, so I do appreciate the, the effort. And anybody else who wanted to weigh in, Ms. Palmer, I think. I just have to say one, one peculiar thing. This is not an answer to your question, David, on any, by any stretch of the imagination. But yesterday, we got um, uh, information on the assessments coming out and commercial real estate assessments went down, residential assessments went up. Um, but one of the things that really stood out was self-storage. Self-storage um, actually um, went up in assessment 
So when you mentioned that the Albemarle County, uh, excuse me, the Albemarle Business Park is uh, building their self storage um, units, I think first, as I remember, there's obviously an economic reason for that. But, um, you know, there's, there's definitely tension there. Yeah, no, pe people are definitely clearing stuff out of their homes because they're in their homes all the time in spaces that were for storage are now being used for living. That's something we're doing in our house as well. We've got our permit hanging in our window about our basement uh, finishing that we're doing. <laughs> okay. I'd, I'd like to jump in just to, but not take too much time for Greg and for Lance, just to say that David, it's inescapable, that level of tension on both sides. And that's part of the reason why the current board is the current board in the aftermath of the decision after 12 midnight to authorize a bypass. So that's just inevitable in a community that cares about natural resource values and at the same time continues to grow by 12 to 1400 people every year. I jumped in, I know there are other people that should be ahead, but um, I, I wanted to just say, it's inevitable and nothing much the board can do to mitigate it. No worries. Thank you, Ray. And David, to your point, my supervisor at UVA was telling me the other day, he doesn't feel like he's uh, working from home. He feels like he's living at work. And that's definitely something I can identify with as well. Tom, I think you're up next. Uh, thank you. Um, quite ambitious. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Lance, really complicated project that's probably got a lot of assumptions built in but I maybe it's just me but I didn't see dollars anywhere in this thing and it I there was no capital cost over the next 10 20 50 years there's no incremental cost it's not free um and if someone was to ask me in the area is this a five million dollar thing is it a 50 million dollar thing I I don't know um has anybody done any kind of, what's the budget for this? It's, you know, it's, it's a guess, but it's at least some, an exercise. And two, not everything, some of these things are going to lower costs over the long term, hopefully, but a lot of them will never be cost favorable um, or the return is so long, but that's how we rank which projects you get the most bang for the buck for. Is there something there? Maybe I, this is my first introduction to it. So if there's work like this has been done ahead of time, my apologies. I'll, I'll just start by saying that uh, I, I did indicate that in phase two, the phase we're now in, we are gonna be taking a closer look at um, the actions to determine which of them are most cost effective. Um, and so, yeah, we, we don't know at this point, there wasn't time during the last couple of years to do that exercise for 135 actions, but that's, is something that we intend to do to kind of uh, drill in a little bit on what the costs of things are gonna be versus what their outcomes are gonna be. And it's really hard though to, to say, what's the value of uh, you know better equity in the community? What's the value of uh, making the community more livable? And a lot of things that uh, might be climate positive also pr promote or uh, result in other benefits to the community as well. So it's, it's not going to be you know, clean accounting by any measure. Um, and I'm glad you pointed out that um, a lot of climate initiatives are going to end up paying for themselves. If the county invests in, or if anybody invests in insulating their, their buildings a little bit more, you know, that's a small investment up front, but it's gonna pay you dividends for many, many years. Um, that's what I love about climate action planning as opposed to say, doing a stream restoration where the benefits are, are really squishy as far as like, you know, is the money we spent on that, you know, that's never going to come back to our pocket, but in, for climate action, it, it really will in a lot of cases. Right. But we need to know what that money is. You're right. Not everything, there's hard dollars against soft issues and, and there are parts of your brain that are trying to reconcile, but, but people still need to know what are we in for on this thing? And, and I, I, uh, I mean, if you look at recycling aluminum, that's very profitable. Recycling newspaper, that's never going to be a winner. So we just need to have, we just need to know. I, that's, that's just my opinion. Thanks.
Thank you, Tom. Roger? Yeah, um, Greg, as you were talking, um, I was thinking about the difference between things that the county has real control over, like your own buildings or our own buildings and a uh, fleet of buses and things like that as compared to what's under the private sector. And I was reminded that back when Fifth Street Station was being developed in the early days when Chris Dummer was the Scottsville supervisor, there was a proposal to have green roofs on all the buildings there. And I think the Board of Supervisors actually had made that a requirement but then after a while, it was um, brushed aside because the developer pled that they couldn't um, handle the cost. So I think since then, green roofs have not even come onto the agenda and they have energy benefits and stormwater benefits too. And I'm just, um, I just wanted to make the point that um, for a lot of this to really take effect, it requires the private sector, not just the county. And um, I don't know how you get these things implemented again, but it's interesting that they kind of drop off and get forgotten. Yeah, agreed. I think the point that uh, the county doesn't control very much of this carbon footprint is, is right on. And we recognize that. And so a lot of what um, we um, say in the plan is that we, you know, we'll do uh, what's right in house, but we're also going to um, educate, encourage, empower, whatever we can do to to kind of push the community along with us and pull the community along with us, and and we're really just going to benefit from technological advancements. Honestly, you know, in in ten years, there's going to be a lot of electric vehicles on the road, and those are going to be more efficient and have a smaller carbon footprint than the 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 vehicles we drive today, and that's going to go right into our our emission, the next in emission inventory, you know, and we're going to take advantage of those things that are just happening around us. And so it's, it really, it's, it's, the county has a role, but everybody here has a role. Everybody in the community has a role and um, we just have to, you know, work together. Robert. You're on mute right now, Rob. There I go. Okay, um, David's comment and uh, to an extent Rogers also and uh, Thomas's points out that we, um, while this is a county focused plan, we don't exist in a vacuum. And from a political point of view, utility policy in the state of Virginia has an awful lot to do with the total volume of emissions because it really doesn't matter whether uh, those emissions are necessarily within the county as a small part of a larger effort or whether they're somewhere else because the electricity we use is generated by fossil fuels. So David's point about increased electricity, say to fund server farms and internet access, for example, a lot of that, there has certainly been a move among the major players, Amazon Web Services and others to help uh, to buy essentially electricity from solar and wind power generation. So I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that while we're, while this is a county plan, it's within a framework and to a large extent, we need to have the supervisors or whoever is appropriate to reach out uh, to our delegates and to the state officials because whatever happens surrounding us will have as much impact as what we actually do within the county itself. So I think uh, there's a dimension there that we need to very much keep in mind as far as uh, energy policy goes within the state itself. Karen Byrock, did you have a uh, comment you wanted to make? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. My internet is run by gerbils, so I don't know if you can understand me. But um, I, I also was curious to hear a little bit more maybe about the, the forestry aspect of it. Uh, one of the, the key carbon sinks uh, for, you know, greenhouse gases is, of course, the trees. And um, I began my day at 7 a.m. in a general assembly session where we had a proposal to 
allow local governments to set up their own canopy standards for different zoning classes. And unfortunately, it was tabled for a year of further study, um, although I might get to lead that study. But nevertheless, the point is that um, we need to figure out ways to retain as much vegetation on sites as we can and to build in as compact a manner as we can. Because if you look at paved over it is, there are a number of things we can do in the county, not just with retaining vegetation, but also um, changing our parking standards. There are a lot of ways that we can even green up uh, existing developments. And then some of our large malls that are seas of asphalt. So as they redevelop ways to bring in elements that are carbon sinks. So just I just wanted to put in that plug and then hear if, um, how far along you are in the tree thinking. Uh, there are some great software tools from companies like uh, US Forest Service <laughs> that you can measure the carbon sequestration of both urban and rural forests and generate some really useful numbers. So I, I don't know to what degree you're using some of those software tools. And that that was myself. We're, we're using ICLE ClearPath as one of our tools for developing an emission inventory. And they have a new cohort or uh, element to that model um, that, that deals with uh, forestry and ag and, and landscape and things like that. So it's kind of a new thing for a lot of people, um, but we're, we're actually partnering with the city and UVA right now to, to take this class basically to learn about this new tool that will allow us to take all those things into consideration. So it's it's kind of like one of the newer elements of the, the model, basically. Um, but yes, we're, we're trying to learn as much as we can. None of us are experts right now. But uh, the, the, you know, the more we do this, of course, the, the better we'll get at it. All right, are there any other questions for Greg or Lance? I just have a comment that um, on piggybacking on Karen's um, in the landscape, natural resources and ag strategies, they do mention um, in several por portions, um, forestry and uh, land cover. Um, and, and I do think that some of our policies and um, practices that could reinforce that is incredibly important. and probably of lower cost than a lot of the other things we can do. And so I'm hoping that we will have um, a, a great deal of evidence, um, uh, I'm sorry, of um, emphasis put on the land use portion of this. So just a comment. And I'll just mention that um, one of our main partners in this area is going to be the Soil Water Conservation District. And you probably know Ann Coates, the director of the, the local district. And she has experience out in California before she moved here with, with climate action planning. And so she's really been on top uh, to learn about, um, you know, the, the, the ag uh, pers uh, best management practices that will, will be most uh, carbon positive and so forth. So we're we expect to work a lot with, with the district in the future on that. Well, Greg, Lance, thank you so much for your time this evening. I definitely appreciate uh, you taking the time to learn us up on that and, uh, and answer our questions. Uh, so thanks again. Um, the next item on our agenda is one of the many times I wished we were meeting in person rather than virtually, because I think it's going to be a little bit more of a discussion, uh, but is a frame for it. Uh, a, several CAC members emailed me an article in the Daily Progress about a cannabis facility that was opening in our area and expressed some concern that we hadn't discussed that uh, before it was announced as opening. Uh, and in a similar vein, uh, that Albemarle Business Campus was sort of proceeding in a way that what ran contrary to some concerns that were addressed by the CAC. Uh, so first I'll turn it over to Tori to sort of give us an update on those two areas uh, and then open up the floor uh, so we can sort of discuss what we think our role as a CAC should be uh, and how to address those issues. So with that, Tori, over to you. Um, 
Thanks, James. I'll start off with the um, cannabis regulations and then um, maybe we can just open it up if there's any discussion and then move on to the um, ABC development. Um, so I tried to do a little bit of research into this. Um, there's kind of the two tiers of regulation for state and local. Um, for medical marijuana only in Virginia. So looking at the state regulations, um, the state code restricts the number of permits that the Virginia Pharmacy Board can issue in any or renew in any year to five permits. And the state has divided up um, the entire state into health service areas. Um, it's a little bit confusing because they're not divided up, you know, exactly by um, how other regions are divided up, like the planning district commissions or the health districts, it's a little different. But um, this area falls into health service area one, which includes 32 localities. So it includes Charlottesville, Shenandoah Valley, around Winchester, and then over to um, Fredericksburg. And so um, localities within each health service area are sort of applicants in those areas are competing against each other since there's only one permit from the state for each health service area. Um, so if another locality in that health service area um, gets awarded the permit, then it wouldn't be able to open anywhere else in that health service area. So looking at the state website, it said that the Board of Pharmacy um, is scheduled to review scoring and identify which applicant will be awarded conditional approval Sounds like applications were submitted late last year and they would schedule the finalized conditional approval at the end of March. Um, so my understanding is that nothing has been approved yet. I think um, there was an applicant in Albemarle who submitted a proposal, but there were some other applicants as well, including um, Fluvanna County. So they haven't decided yet who will actually get the permit to be able to open. Um, and then as far as local regulations, so again, this is a newer use. Um, we don't have this use here in the county yet, but zoning has reviewed the proposal. And if um, an applicant did come here, there's sort of two categories that it could fall under um, or both. So if there was the sale of medical marijuana products that in the zoning ordinance would be con considered a retail store, and that would be allowed um, by right in C1 commercial, highway commercial, and then the planned shopping centers and planned mixed commercial districts. Um, and then on the other side, there's the pharmaceutical processing part of it. And that would be considered um, under the ordinance as manufacturing, processing, assembly, fabrication, recycling, that really long general use, which is allowed by right in light industrial, heavy industrial, and planned industrial park zoning districts. Um, and those industrial districts do allow retail sales as well, but they limit them to 25% or less of the gross um, floor area. And those manufacturing uses are also permitted in the C1 commercial, highway commercial, um, and planned shopping center and mixed commercial districts, but they are limited to 4,000 square feet, except by special exception. Um, and I don't know if um, anyone else who's read the article or if any of the supervisors have anything to add, but that's my understanding of the state and local regulations. I know nothing about the state and the local re um, regulations, Tori, so thank you for that. I will say that this did not come before the board. I'm trying to remember how, mu how, how much sooner I found out about it than than the general public in the paper. And as I remember, it was like 24 hours or something like that. So this was not something that went through a process that would ordinarily, you know, come to the CAC or the board, so. And I have nothing to add, Corey. I think you really covered it very well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that background, Tori. And Dave, do you mind just uh, running through sort of your thoughts and, and uh, concerns around this? Sure. I went ahead and pulled up Alice and Rabel's article from December 1st, and it said that the Board of Supervisors and the Economic Development Authority sent letters of support to a committee with the Board of Pharmacy for application for Holistic Virginia LLC to operate a pharmaceutical processing facility in Albemarle. So, so that's the article that, that popped in. And I'll try and see if I can drop the, the link into 
the chat for everyone um, just so everybody can, can, can grab it quickly. Um, it's located, uh, the proposed location, or at least the one that was discussed, uh, was on Avon Street Extended um, in an area that's basically across Moores Creek from my residential neighborhood. So if we're talking about processing cannabis in, in a location that's zoned for it, which it sounds like we are, um, my concern was, you know, are, are we risking um, runoff into Moores Creek, which is already very polluted, um, and then in a, a very flippant way, um, when Krispy Kreme bakes the donuts across Moores Creek, um, I get that all the time if I'm walking my kids to the bus stop or something like that. If they're processing cannabis near a residential area, um, what's the impact on on that residential area? It's um, so so those were the pieces that came to me that that the board and the EDA um, were in support of this, and, and that's great. I know we don't have a lot of uh, light industrial or heavy industrial uh, land in the in the county for something like this, um, but just the finding out about it through that newspaper article, um, and again. Um, I don't have a problem with economic development. I don't want it to come across that way. I don't want people to think I'm, I'm bad mouthing them. Um, but, but when we're up against these residential areas, um, and I understand sometimes these things have to be quieter than others, um, th there were certainly people in my neighborhood who um, asked me about it and I just didn't have anything I could tell them. So yeah, I I, I, yeah, I don't think there's a lot to add. Um, you know, we, we uh, as a board, offered our support towards a potential business coming into the area, but it's far from assured as, you know, Supervisor Palmer was saying, um, it's a long way before um, anything would actually take place. But if, as, as I perceived it at the time at least, if we wanted to have an opportunity for um, this business, we needed to provide some measure of support towards the industry at that time. And, and that's about, as I recall, that's about where it was at that point. I, I just looked up the letter because I had totally, completely forgotten about that. And that came to the Board of Supervisors on the 25th of November. So five days before, I guess, it hit the thing. Um, and my, regard, my, my email back was, are these pot growers? Um, the, um, the was, I guess it was something that went predominantly through the um, Economic Development Authority. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll admit it, I, I don't always jump up if it's gone through Economic Development Authority. I try to pick my, my arguments. And, um, and I did, I was surprised about it, but I didn't raise any, uh, alarms, I went ahead and agreed with it. But, you know, it was the 25th when the board in general saw this for the first time, saw the letter. And so I, it wasn't long and I, say, I don't have, I don't have a general opposition to what we've, yeah. what's been presented to us at this point. Yeah, I, I can't say as I, I, I did much about it, David. And that's fine. I think, I think that if and, and maybe this is as we come a little bit closer into to March or April, and and if the board of pharmacy looks favorably upon it, then we can, um, you know, there, there's going to have to be an opportunity to to really try and get out in front of this from an economic development standpoint, if you want to, because um, you know, residents just saying I don't need. You know, cannabis processing, pot processing, you know, across the creek from my house. It's, you know, there are definitely people who are going to be um, noisy about it in my neighborhood. And again, like I said, I'm not, you know, I don't know enough to know exactly what the, you know, the, the little reading I did, you know, talks about, you know, some dangers in runoff and in the production and the chemicals that are used um, in terms of if they can leach out. And I know Again, it's a nice re an adaptive reuse of space that we've got that's industrial. Um, it's it's just that you know that that area of Avon Street is really thought of as industrial when in reality um, 
you know, a couple hundred feet away across Morse Creek, you have residences, um, but they don't enter onto Avon. So they sort of get forgotten occasionally. Um, and I know Tori's going to bring back um, the Avon Court um, site plan next month for us, we hope, um, because that, you know, again, is right up against Moore's Creek and, and property that, you know, people in my neighborhood have asked me about and what that process is. So, um, and I know that's by right, so that's a little different. So it's just, just sort of hit our area um, <laughs> kind of hard right around the holidays. And that makes it tough if the, if it came to the board on the 25th of November, that's either right before or right after, I can't remember now. Um, you know, just a couple of days before Thanksgiving. So it's, the, you know, the timing certainly was a little tough and obviously not able to get into our November meeting. Tom, I think I saw you next. Uh, one comment, two questions. Um, uh, as, as a pharmaceutical company, two doors down from where this might go, uh, we were asked to comment, we're a DEA, FDA approved facility licensed by the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, it is a federal, it's still a federal crime, maybe not for long. So we passed on commenting on it because DEA is kind of funny about things. Like we just didn't want to be associated with it. Um, as far as runoff, I'm not sure uh, runoff would be an issue for a modern factory. Uh, it, I, I'm just not sure that they would they would be able to build it that way. Having said that, um, control of their trash and refuge and things like that is going to be, I think, would be really important uh, just to prevent crime or people interested in in seeing poking around there and seeing what they can uh, resell or consume so that would be um important but i guess my one question then would be do we know how many employees um uh, liz or donna do you know what the employment it would bring to the area i'll have to look at the letter again yeah i don't recall i, I don't think we're talking of tremendously it large wasn't big that's i remember yeah okay um, Jim, this is James, this is Diane. Okay, I can't, Diane. I can't wave my hand. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what happened. This is the first time this has happened to me on a Zoom meeting. I can't get my video going, but Zoom gets us all eventually. My question is about the process. So here's where I'm a little confused. Um, and I think some others are speaking to this. So this, um, no matter what what the business would be, wouldn't it be something that, so it went to um, economic development, went to the board of supervisors and where do we fit into that? My understanding, and again, I'm the new kid on the block here. Um, is that something like this, a business that impacts our, our area of purview here wouldn't, something like this come to us first? It doesn't necessarily, it didn't even come to the Board of Supervisors. We were asked to write a letter of support, but we weren't asked to approve anything. It didn't come as a development. Uh, you know, they're reusing a building. So if they're not changing the building in some way or, you know, putting in something new, it's, it's not necessarily gonna come to us. Um, I guess not being able to go back and read the article right now, um, it went through the Economic Development Authority, I guess, I think, because um, that's who asked us to write a letter of support. Um, and the Economic Development Authority is an authority. They, they are, everything they do does not necessarily come to the Board of Supervisors. We do not hear everything that they do. We have a liaison to that board, um, a board of supervisor member that's a liaison who attends all their meetings. Um, but the board as a whole is not necessarily weighing in on everything that they do. Um, certainly if we're putting funds, if we're putting um, economic development funds in there, we're gonna hear about it. But if there's no money involved, there's, it's, it's not something that we're necessarily going to hear about. 
Okay, thank you. Tori, correct me if I'm speaking incorrectly, but I believe we don't usually get uh, visibility on things if it's a by right use of the property. And this is a by right use, which is why even if it was approved, it might not necessarily come before us, except that in some corners of our community, a cannabis processing facility is necessarily controversial. So we're, we're interested in it, but is, is that a fair summary if it's by right? Typically we wouldn't get a look at it. That's correct, yes. Great, thanks. Uh, MK, I saw your hand next. Yep. <laughs> Could I? Oh, sorry. I was just going to comment on your, your point, James, about, can I just sure. make a quick comment? Um, it, even a by right development has to have a site plan and the county holds site plan meetings. And so when we get the list of site plans that are coming up, I try to do a quick skim of those to see if there are any for this area, because you could, uh, attend a site plan meeting and get into some of the details about how the site is being laid out. So even though the use is by right, there still are opportunities to influence the site plan. It doesn't necessarily come to the CAC, but if the CAC were interested in a site, you know, if you could attend, theoretically you could attend the site planning meeting with the county or let me know about your concerns and relay. Great, thanks, Karen. MK? Uh, yeah, thanks, Karen, and and thank you, Tori. Um, I read the article while everyone was talking. You know, obviously, it, it's not in the backyard of my neighborhood, but um, personally, I'm in favor of this type of business in our community and would not have, if it was in my backyard, probably wouldn't have the same concerns that maybe David's neighbors have. So I just wanted to voice my support for the county's letter of support. Thanks, okay. Craig? Yeah, I just want to kind of clarify. So it sounds like if the state approves this one, then it's pretty much a go, except for, like Karen said, a site plan. I mean, there's no other zoning or anything else that needs to be done. If they get state approval, it's a go. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Um, if they were in one of the um, industrial districts and wanted to do, um, you know, more than 25% commercial, or if they were in one of the commercial districts and wanted to do more than 4,000 square feet of the industrial and processing, they would need a special exception and that would go to the board. However, if we're just doing the um, uses that are allowed by right with the square footages that are allowed by right, then it would need to go through site planning um, and a zoning clearance, but it would not go to the board. David? Oh, um, I just had a couple last points about um, a couple of, of things that tie into this. One is Avon Street Extended. Um, and and it, the um, ARB recently was asked about whether or not um, the county should pursue entrance corridor status or getting entrance corridor status back there. Um, and I was surprised when they suggested uh, against it for Avon Street Extended, um, which which I found interesting that the ARB didn't want to regulate how things look in, in some portion um, based on how active they've been elsewhere. Um, and I know that we as a, a committee have discussed how we felt about that piece as well and whether or not, um, especially in light of the um, corridor study that we had done and, and our ability to maybe implement some of those things. So um, I just found that an interesting piece because um, as of now, it's not enforced, but Avon Street Extended is still listed as being an entrance corridor, even though it no longer meets um, state requirements for that. And so I, I know that that's still coming a piece. And then uh, lastly, to Karen's point about the site plan meetings, um, I think it's been at least eight months, probably closer to 10 without site plan meetings that are in person. And so everything has to be submitted electronically. And I don't know how the public would best do that. So Karen, I'll have to get with you on how to maybe get some submissions in for those things that we see. And we do appreciate getting the emails from the county 
on on the site plan pieces that come before them um, so we can at least see what's in our areas. So thanks, James. I appreciate that. So I'll try and uh, succinctly summarize what we discussed. Uh, I think the initial take was we were surprised that the uh, Board of Supervisors endorsed something that we hadn't heard about that was controversial with some members of the community. Um, but certainly nobody on this panel has expressed any direct concern uh, with the facility itself. And we acknowledge that it's by right, um, but because of the nature of the business, uh, going in, it might have been nice to sort of hear about that before it was endorsed by the Board of Supervisors. Is that a fair summary of the group's opinion? I'll take, yeah. uh, I'll take silence yes. consent. Yes. Yes. Great. And, and I think what we can take from that as board members is that when we see a letter, letter like that, we should forward it over to you guys. And um, if that happens again, to, to notify you. So that is something we need to do. Thanks, Supervisor. <laughs> you know, I think probably 99.9% .9 of the letters you get are unlikely to ruffle any feathers, particularly when it's a by right use. But I think um, the, the rapidly changing nature of public attitudes towards cannabis in the country make this a hot button issue for some people, uh, is, is how I'll phrase that. So, Thank you, uh, point well taken. Uh, and then Tori, let's uh, circle back around and talk about ABC, because I know there's some, uh, there's some opinions on that as well. Sure, um, let me share my screen. Um, hopefully that shows up okay. Although it's in uh, the other presenter mode, there we go. Um, so there is an approved um, initial site plan um, for Albemarle Business Campus, which was approved uh, for the uses allowed and the density allowed with the rezoning. Um, I think it was mid-October of last year. Um, so this is the initial site plan number 2020-66. And the applicant submitted an initial site plan for the whole project, but there will be final site plans for each phase individually. Um, and I think everyone probably knows where this is, but just a quick refresher. Um, it's located along Fifth Street, Old Lynchburg Road, across from the county um, Fifth Street office building, um, a little bit south of I-64. So there's um, phases one, three, four, and five um, are all in the same parcel. Um, and like I said, there will be final site plans submitted separately for each phase. So this first phase um, outlined in the kind of darker blue is for a um, 100,000 square foot self storage facility with a 5,000 um, square foot restaurant. And then um, phase three is a 66,000 square foot um, office space. Phase four, um, located over here in the red, is 6,000 square feet apparel store and 4,200 square feet um, variety store. Not exactly sure what that is, um, but that was the listed use on the initial site plan. And then phase five um, is this hotel over here outlined in the green. Um, it's an 85 room hotel. So the rezoning allowed between 74,000 and 401 square thousand um, total feet for non-residential uses. And then on the other parcel are the residential uses. So the rezoning allowed up to 128 um, units. So those are the proposed apartments that they wanna do all 128. Um, and all of these parcels are located within the entrance corridor. So this will also be going through architectural review board review, um, along with the final site plans. There'll be all of the typical engineering reviews too um, for stormwater management. And then um, just included the building heights in case anyone was interested. So the maximum in any of the blocks is 60 feet. Um, and there's a range between one and four stories. So that's what's been um, submitted so far. And I can also give you all the contact information for the lead planner um, on the projects. If you have any 
um, more detailed questions as well. But at this point, no final site plans have been submitted. So I'm not sure what the developer's expected timeline is on that, but the initial site plans approved. Great, thanks, Tori. Uh, and I wanted to specifically ask David and, and uh, Sean, who both emailed uh, our supervisors uh, about this and to summarize their concerns. And then with that as a backdrop, sort of figure out what our role as a CAC is, uh, if we have concerns as a group about something, how we can, uh, how we can sort of formally address that in a, in a way that uh, is most likely to resonate uh, and make a difference. So Sean, over to you. Thank you, James. Thanks, Tori, for the overview. Um, and and I've, I'll preface this as the supervisors know, because they've, they've seen it for me. I, I live about a mile from this spot and I know it extremely well. I run by it a few times a week. I bike by it. I drive by it every day, pretty much. Um, I am very much in favor of this spot being developed, both, both parcels being developed in a, in a productive way, because I think it's one of the last great spots in the county that can be done for, uh, for terrific uh, development. And I said that when there, I think it was the June meeting when the developer came and spoke to us. Um, I'll raise the same concerns I raised then, which was um, first, if, if there was, you know, this was predicated on uh, there being such a need for class, is it class A, class B office space? And I apologize, uh, David will correct me when I'm wrong on this one. I can't remember if it's class A or class B, but uh, yeah. there's a great, thank you. There was a great need for office space. Um, and yet the, the facility included self-storage. And we raised the question then, if there's such a great need for, self, for, for the, the office space uh, in the county, why are we, why are we including self-storage? Um, and now, and the, the answer was, well, that's what we can fit there. And it's, it's a, it's a profitable way, uh, to, to fill the space. Um, now we look at this phase one is going to be a very substantial, um, self storage facility. The first thing that gets built on the site is going to be a self storage facility, um, which one, I think that I don't think it's a good use of the space. And two, I certainly don't want that to be the first thing that gets put up there. Um, looking at the, the, the overview that Tori sent, I, I didn't see any of the pocket parks anymore. And maybe that's just because the development plan doesn't include the overall site plan. Um, but I know there was a pocket park, uh, pocket park on the, the corner of Old Lynchburg and Fifth Street. There was another uh, proposed dog park uh, in the back of the parcel, which we also questioned because there's a dog park at Azalea Park, which is city, but it's just down the street. Um, I didn't see either one of those there. But again, I have continued concerns with how they're phasing this. Uh, as well as the overall use of the space, um, I have a lot of concerns. I, I think it is a great opportunity to make a fantastic development for the space. I think it is being uh, taken advantage of. Um, and I think we're going to get into a situation where the, uh, the more profitable, uglier parts get built first, um, which is gonna be the self-storage and the residential. Um, and maybe the other parts get done eventually in a way that we aren't going to be happy with at the end of the day. And I have, I have a lot of concerns with how this proposed phasing is. David, do you have anything to add there? I will. Uh, th thanks, Sean, for speaking about it uh, so passionately. Um, my concern more is that, that the county was invested into this um, with in terms of the financing and, and the tax incremental um, revenue that we that we were talking about and and so there were no safeguards put in the agreement and and this is sort of where i come back to that that if this was all sold on as sean put the need for class a office space um that the county in its in negotiations and its investment in in the in the parcels um that they could have um, done something to ensure that that would be what was developed first. Um, so now, and I understand every every business has to make money. And um, Supervisor Palmer pointed out that self storage units, the value of those has gone up, have gone up uh, in the last year in the assessments, whereas most commercial has gone down, in part because of the the way the life has changed in the last year. Um, it's also expected that that when we do find um, 
you know, either get herd immunity through vaccines or, or whatever comes back to being the new normal, that commercial values are going to go up again. Um, and, and we heard that with the hotel piece as well um, in that presentation to the board on um, yesterday. Is it today or yesterday? Um, and, and so my concern more was with the, the process. Um, um, I, I also took issue with the self-storage piece, um, and I compared it against what was proposed over off of Mill Creek Drive behind the bank um, and how that neighborhood um, and those neighborhoods, which were probably more accustomed to um, being active, uh, especially in relation to the initial um, convenience center, which had been proposed for the county-owned property, off of Mill Creek that they reacted quickly um, and that the developer put that on hold knowing um, there was a significant community opposition. Um, and I'm thinking that neighborhoods where we've got a lot of renters and, and people who aren't as used to being active, which we see I think along Fifth Street more so, um, that, that they just didn't have that opportunity to speak about the, the self storage piece. and. I don't know if it's our role to be community organizers to organize that. Um, I know we've got more representation in that area. Um, Supervisor Palmer had talked about that um, for a few years now about making sure that that part of, of the county and, and the, the Southern and Western area um, was, was um, properly rec um, represented on this committee. So, so my concerns were more right now um, in terms of process and that, that we were sold that we need all this class A office space and now it's phase three and who knows when phase three is gonna come. Um, and to be honest, really, who knows when phase one or phase two are gonna come depending on the economy. But certainly we know people are coming um, to the county. So it's a great place to live. We talked uh, at length about the impact this would have on Mountain View Elementary, 128 apartments coming online as well. Um, and what, because we saw that from uh, Timber Creek Apartments um, needing their own full bus of 50 kids to, to Mountain View when it uh, opened in 2019. So I think I've rambled on long enough um, and, and everybody, um, at least our, our elected and, and two appointed officials to the Planning Commission received my letter. Um, it was, it was, I hope it didn't come off as mean as I felt like the when I read it the second time. It was, there was, it's not mean. And like Sean, I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity for the county in a great location. And, and I just worry that um, the county's not getting its money's worth out of it at this point. Thanks. So um, I, I think the planning commissioners could probably talk more specifically about this than I can. Um, but one of the things I'd love to have Tori talk about is the is the timing, you know, the um, staging and whether we can say to somebody, you can't have self-storage there. Um, you know, you can't put self-storage in there and you can't put that in first. So Tori, could you just explain our ability to control those things first? And then I've got some comments on the process and then I'm love to hear from our planning commissioners. Sure. Um, my understanding is that, um, you know, planning staff does not, or the board does not really have a say in what gets built first in the phasing. Um, you know, what's in the approved code of development shows the allowed uses per block. Um, but if they choose to phase it in a certain way, um, they're certainly allowed to do that. They do need to meet each um, requirement at each phase for things like open space and street connections. Um, I didn't show the landscape plan on the initial site plan. I haven't looked at it too carefully, um, but it does show, I think, at least one pocket park. There may be a dog park as well. Um, so, you know, when they build the residential units, they'll have to have the required open space for that, um, for that phase and each phase for open space and Landscaping and sidewalks and street connections will have to be able to stand alone. Um, but as long as their, you know, rezoning application um, allows for for phasing and to have different blocks, then they're allowed to do that as long as they're meeting the code of development requirements. Thank you. That was my understanding: is that we have no control over over those kinds of things. 
Um, I thought, and with and a, a quick thing about the pocket parks and the dog park, um, I wanted the dog park there. I think Castalia Park is a really crummy dog park and we need more, um, but it was the board's decision to not um, tell them what they had to put in that spot. They wanted them to decide, um, want the developer to decide what was best to go in that spot. So that was a overall decision on the board. Um, you know, and so we don't know, but they do have to put some kind of open space in that in that spot, um, is my understanding. Um, the and and so to your point, Sean, I, I was under the impression that we really couldn't control those things, um, the phasing, and as Tori has pointed out, the process. I'll admit, um, I I had some problems with the process, and and. David and Sean, I spent a bit of time with your letters and Karen will remember me sending them to you and we're having conversations and what can we do? What can we ask for? Um, that was one of my issues um, and that's my own, I, I know I've been on the board a long time but it is my inexperience and in that I'm not quite sure what we can ask for with proffers. We're not supposed to ask for a proffer we're supposed to, and our best situation is when we have some board, you know, when we have a few board members that don't want to vote for something. Um, and, and so it, it's, it, it really becomes this dance when we try to get these additional, you know, additional things. We do need to have something specific to ask for. And um, maybe Karen can, or, or Rick can, Put um, give us some more information on how that went, and and I I can't say that I was incredibly happy about how we approved the economic development thing first. Um, it was the board's um, uh, feeling that we had a very independent planning commission, and they would not be overly influenced by our um, decision on on the economic development side of it. And we do have an independent planning commission and we appreciate them. But um, Karen, could you kind of talk about um, how at w the process of, of asking for more in a situation like this? Can you hear me? Sure, so yeah, um, sure. So in terms of the different uses, usually, you know, you look to our zoning code to see what we allow all the different uses under different zoning classes. Theoretically, they could have proffered to not include self storage, right? They would have been there. That is possible for someone to limit their own development and take out some of the things that perhaps they would be aware the county doesn't want. Um, and, and Liz is correct, we can't directly ask for proffers, but there, there are ways of letting things be known, you know, like, let's say, I'll just make up something. Liz Palmer hates self-storage, and she says it every every day of the week, um, and they, they get that idea. But um, I'm sure the developer wants to build the self-storage first, because as we've heard from other developers, it's very lucrative. To. They then make money off of that and that funds them. It's developers not to start with the self-storage component. We've had pushback because that's that's the cash cow that allows them to do the other phase. In, in terms of the process that went on, um, I appreciate, um, you know, Liz Palmer knows that I'm independent and Rick is independent, um, but nevertheless, I I did complain about the, this process again. This is either the second or the third time that the county has um, sort of approved a, a component of a project in a sense by funding it and then asking us to review it. And any good poker player will know that you don't want to give away uh, half your cards before you start the negotiation. And so I feel like um, there were I don't, I am not a fan of this particular development because I think that it doesn't go far enough. The county is not a major investor in this. In other words, if you looked at the amount of money the project probably costs, 
and the county's investment, the county is not, you know, a, a majority owner of this site or uh, nor did we invest enough money to really give us a huge amount of clout. But that said, I think that we should have allowed the planning commission to weigh in with our thoughts, even if it was only in a workshop setting on what we think would make a quality development here. Um, and then the, and the, so I don't like the process of this uh, give, you know, having some sort of tacit, it's, it's almost like a tacit approval. If the board has already said, we want to invest in this, that does put pressure on the commission. I also complained to the developers through multiple emails that their designs were not innovative. There was so much more they could do on this site. Um, but I, I pushed it as, as hard and as far as I could. In terms of the parks, and then I'll stop talking, in terms of the parks, um, there were these chunks of little parks and we asked them to connect them. So actually some of these sort of rectangles you see through the site with a little pathway, that was their attempt to rearrange things to make a connected network. It's not great, it's better than it was, but um, to me, when I look at this site from above, I see a lot of asphalt and a lot of building footprint and very, very little in terms of how they're doing the landscaping or, or the amenities on the site. And as someone who just spent many months looking for office space and finding none, went all the way to the southern part of the county, uh, you know, I, I guess I don't see that this site has got enough amenities to really make it an attractive site. And this is just my opinion as one commissioner. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm pretty transparent in, in how I think. And with that, I'll maybe turn it over to, uh, to Donna and Rick. Well, but if, unless anyone wants to ask me any questions about the four uh, things I just ran through. I mean, I, so I, I'd love to ask a, a question and, and I mean, so I've, I've had concerns about this since the, the EDA um, authorization to buy in back last, I guess it was close to a year ago. Um, you know, and, and my original concerns were if the EDA is approved, um, are we tacitly approving the entire development? And the answer from everyone was no, 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 that's not how it works. Um, our, our authorization to buy into this at a very low level doesn't approve any of the site plan. And then as you proceed through the process, what I'm hearing is, well, we're already in for a dime, so we might as well be in for a dozen. And my concern is, Everyone on this call, either quietly or, 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 or out loud, seems to have concerns with the process, with the design plan, with the level of proffers, given the total profitability and the total size of the project. Um, we all seem to be on the same page here, which is the developer should be doing more. There should be better proffers, there should be better design, there should be better implementation, there should be better phasing. Yet here we are a year later and none of our concerns seem to have been realized in what has been approved and where we are in the process. So as a person that's only been on this board for maybe two years, help me understand where is the shortfall coming? Where can we do things better? How do we not, all I hear is, Yes, we're all unhappy with this process. We all believe this can be done better. Yet, I don't have any idea how I can improve this the next time around when someone does this. Or can we still pivot this project to make it represent more about what our community should see and wants to see? Because other than the county office building, this is the only commercial development that is south of 64 that I can think of offhand, um, at least in, in, in our corridor, I, I guess not, not on the Avon side, um, but, but on, the, on the Fifth Street side. So help me understand what can we do better or what can we do now? So I'm gonna just say, I did not know well, what I to ask for, okay? So I just wanna be really clear. It's not that I think this is a terrible development or a great development, I honestly, was not sure what the process would be to ask for more. And 
and that's my shortcoming. I apologize. I'm, you know, I'm I'm your representative on the board of supervisors, and I I don't know myself how to ask for more in that situation and get the other board members to come along and, um, you know, and 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 do something different. Um, and so, I, and, and that's, and, and that, it, and I, I do look to the planning commission to sort of say, this is what you should be asking for. And I'm not blaming anything on the planning commission. Believe me, I, Karen has helped me. She's been invaluable um, <laughs> to, to my, uh, to my working through these development plans. But, um, but honestly, I, I simply do not know what I should have done differently to get a better development. Now, the process itself with the Economic Development Authority, that's that's a separate that's a separate issue. And, yeah, and I, it's an I would just add, I'm sorry, Liz, I didn't mean to yeah. add. No, go ahead. Well, when we're dealing with the Economic Development Authority, because of business confidential information, there are certain actions that have to take place before a, a prospective developer is even ready to submit a proposal. And so my understanding is those things have to take place, and they do take place during closed session, before we would ever get to the actual submission of a development. If we had, if we required a potential um, contractor, for lack of a better word, partner through the EDA to publicly announce their intention towards a proposal, it would completely undercut the ability of the EDA to do some of the work they have to do. So, you know, at this point in time, I would say I believe it is an inherent, I'll use the word conflict, between the EDA authorities' responsibilities and things that they can accomplish in, in contrast to what the land use side from you know, the planning commission and the board when it comes to that. But I did not believe that by approving from the board, the EDA's ability to get engaged financially on a potential proposal, that that in any way locked in the county to later approve what was being offered. Um, my recollection is this is a very strange um, proposal that came through because it's sort of a strange looking figure eight that is only connected by this little um, narrow point um, across a side street off of, I guess, Old Lynchburg Road off of, um, you know, Fifth Street down there with all of the commercial on one side, all of the residential on the other. And at the time that this was taking place, um, Class A business um, office space was something that was very important for the county. Now, in the subsequent year-ish that has taken place, we've had the pandemic and people have been working remotely and those things have changed, but they changed after a lot of the decisions were made. And as we, we know from the um, property assessment information we got last night that's been addressed here, mini storage is the only segment of commercial or business property in the county that has seen an actual increase in their assessments everything else has gone down. Um, and so it is the cash cow, so to speak. In order to generate some of the additional funds that they may need, this is an ability for them to build one building um, and generate some income. Of course, the downside of mini storage is it is the only commercial property that does not actually produce any goods or services. It just generates revenue from people storing their property there. When it came to the other side of the development, I voted against the housing mix. Um, I think two supervisors voted against the housing mix and four approved the housing mix because I didn't think that that met some of the needs. Um, so I think part of what we're doing is second guessing decisions today that second guessing today decisions that were made under somewhat different circumstances over a year ago um, as it was leading up to this. And, and, and that's where I guess I would just leave it. I'm going to throw one more thing in, um, Sean, uh, Sean and, and David. There was a discussion on the board level about the timing of the Economic Development um, Authority decision and, um, and the Planning Commission 
discussion and it was decided um, that that the planning commission, I guess I'm repeating myself, could be independent in their um, in their assessment and what they asked for in the development. Okay, thank you. I do appreciate that. My thought, um, and this is probably a question for the county attorney, to be honest, is that entering into a financial arrangement, you can place conditions on on what happens. So in exchange for this funding, developer, you agree to build class A first. And if the developer finds that that's not attractive to them, they can walk away, in which case we don't have the EDA. And then two months or three months later in June, in July, when we've got the request for rezoning that comes in, it's, it's perhaps that the, the, the planning commission does feel more independent because there's not already this, this approval in some, at some level from, from the board. Um, and, and I would like someone to, and maybe Rick might have the best or either of the supervisors might have this best, but um, when it comes to proffers and commercial spaces, I was under the impression that, that those were a little more open um, for discussion. We do know that the developer proffered out of this any number of things, I think a car wash and, and other types of, of uh, facilities. So, so he was, the developers were well aware of what, what could have been proffered out here. Um, and I understand that um, I look um, to uh, what's going on in Crozet right now and how their CAC um, is reacting to staff's presentations um, most recently in terms of the master plan uh, and, and how they're presenting that out to um, most recently the planning commission. And, and I don't know that we're at the same stage of saying, well, you all must listen to us and you must do as we say, because clearly that's not what we're here. We're supposed to be advisory. Um, but, but when you advise, and, and you're not feeling like you're heard, there's definitely a frustration there. Um, so yeah, so those are the, thing. the things I think. Yeah, and I'm sorry, ahead, Mark, please. I never addressed your initial question, which was about how does your voice get heard? Um, if you watched that board meeting, I actually read somewhat extensively from your comments um, to, the, to, the, um, to the board. So um, you were heard. I mean, your voice was heard. The, the comments that we received from the CAC, I considered to be very valuable and did share them, you know, with the other board members, even though I believe you may have copied all of the board members. I, I read that, you know, asked the questions into the record. Thank you. In the interest of time, uh, let's just take one more comment from MK and then we'll move on. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I made this comment in the chat, but it's not that I don't agree with, um, you know, the concern about the process, but I don't know that I share the concern of building, having them build the self-storage first versus some other phase first, second, or third. Um, I guess, to me, I just don't necessarily see why that's, um, it, you know, tends to have such a huge negative impact. I, I also, I haven't, I don't remember specifically the exterior renderings of the elevations of this particular building. I do think it's um, controlled, climate controlled storage. So it's interior accesses, not exterior versus, you know, that kind of thing. I, I could be wrong about that, but, um, you know, I personally understand like what everybody said is that the developer is going to need to make some cash in order to move on to phase two, you know, and phase three, and hopefully that's going to help them move quicker through the process versus slower. Um, and, you know, do we have an opportunity to improve the visual aspects of the site? Yes, through the planning process, but as far as 
a major concern with which phase they do first. That has not crossed my mind at any point. I know I just don't know that I understand. And maybe Sean or David could explain their concern with that particular piece of it. And, and thanks, MK, for that clarification. My big concern is uh, I haven't seen a timeline for construction and, and development. So, um, but if, if phase one is self storage and phase two is the entire residential side on the other side of the street, and then phase three begins with the class A build out, is that a six month lead time from class from phase one to phase three, or is that a 36 month time frame? Um, if, I, mean, I don't think we get to say, I think, you know, but, I don't think we get to say, I mean, with any development, it could be five years, you know, I mean, well, no, I mean, I, so I, as, a, as a lender, which is what I do in my professional life, like, I absolutely get to say, like, I can guarantee you that if I'm lending money on a project, I know how long each phase takes. Mm -hmm. So what I don't want is self storage to go in plot A, residential build out to take 36 months. And for them to, so, so what we're saying is the developer doesn't have the funds to build phase one through five. And instead they want to bankroll phase one and phase two. And as, as profits come in through that, then they'll build three, four and five. Well, the problem is yes, self storage is profitable. Apartments are profitable, but they aren't a windfall. If the way you're going to build phase three, four, and five is through the profits you earn off of phase one and phase two, we're looking at a 25 year build out. So I think it's entirely reasonable to ask the developer, what is your phasing? What is your cash flow projections? What is your plan? Because if, the, if we're going to build self storage on one site, apartments on the other across the street, and we're going to wait. 24, 36, 48, 60 months before we start building the class A and that beautiful storefront and those pocket parks, I'm uh, sorry, the, the, the pocket parks and all those in the sidewalk improvements and the lighting and all the things that we brought up that we wanted to see, then yeah, I have, I have a major concern with this. So I think we have an absolute right to say, what is your timeline? Because I don't want the developer to be contingent phase three, phase four, phase five, contingent on profitability from phase one and phase two. That's not fair to anyone developing. And I think that's entirely, whether it's a, whether that's at the level of EDA or with the planning commission or what's the board of supervisors, I don't, I don't know what the time frame of that is, but it is an entirely reasonable ask of the developer to say, what is your timeline? What is your cash flow? What is your plan for when these things get built? That hey, is, that, that, well, that is, that is how life works as a lender. No, the timeline for this is how things not work. How it works. No, Sean, you're wrong. Yeah, you're then, wrong, then, Sean. Then, then we need to Sean, do a better job. Sean, Sean then, can, can I? Can I? We got no, a wait, lot Rick, else Rick, to do Rick, here. Wait, 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 Sean, wait, wait. and you're you're then belaboring we, we, a point. Rick, wait, you're belaboring a we, point. We oh. need to do a better job then. No, Sean, because we can absolutely hold the developers' no. feet to the fire when this comes about. No, no Sean, we can't. No, yes, Sean. we can. Sean, it's not how it works. You know what? Do you know what a Dillon rule state is, Sean? Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We only, as a local government, have the powers that are expressly provided by the General Assembly to local government. And as such, as government, you can work in the private sector as a lender and you can demand that. The Board of Supervisors, if they tried to do that with the developer, the developer would have ample reason to take Albemarle County to court for intruding on private decision making and divulging plans and information that does not have anything to do and is not germane to the land use questions before the Planning Commission and the Board. The board and the planning commission are expressly restricted to land use questions. And Liz has brought up the fact that we've seen changes in terms of proffers. And there were, for a while we had some latitude in terms of proffers and then it got very restrictive in 2016. 
and now it's loosened up a little bit, but we, proffers can only be expected under certain very strict criteria determined by the General Assembly. So you're wrong. I hate to tell you, you're wrong. It doesn't work that way. And if with, with you that tried to pull then, that, you would be you would take force the county to go into court. So with, with that with that context in mind, then with that understanding that we cannot enforce even ask apparently um, a timeline. Why don't we no. accept that uh, that that understanding when no. we approve things? No. And you walk cannot. into the situation and say you don't get approval unless we are confident that there's a timeline in place yeah. that it is reasonable. Way, Sean. We're talking about the performance agreement. And, and what I'm going to do is, it, it, it just to straighten this out, I'm going to ask the county attorney to talk about whether they can put phasing timelines into our performance agreements. And I'll get back to you guys. <coughs> Thank you. Thank and you, I, that, All right, that was just- my point, that was kind of my point to Sean. I mean, I'm not, I understand your concern, but my understanding, and I haven't been on this committee very long either, but just about development in, in general in the county. And I was gonna ask Tori or Rick or somebody to, to answer that question. So thank you so much, Rick, was that, you know, I mean, you look at something like Old Trail. I mean, Old Trail has been developed in phases over 15 years. I mean, it does not happen to anybody's specific timeline. I mean, that's just the way development works. The developer, gets the approval and then they do it when they can afford to do it or when it makes sense to do it. And sometimes they never do it. I mean, that's also their choice. I mean, that's the way, that's their use of their land. Um, so it's just not the way that I understand the way the process and, and I don't know if I'm understanding it correctly, but thank you, Rick, because I think you helped to explain it. That's the process if there's not a performance agreement. Okay, if there's a performance you. agreement, I'm just curious if we can put that in and I'll find out. And I, I guess I appreciate that, Liz. And Rick, that's a that's a great. I appreciate the 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 understanding, or the the information, because it's it's a new thing for me coming from what I am in the business life. But I wonder if there's a way to to merge both things, because I certainly understand the Dillon rule. But um, we don't have to approve a rezoning unless we're confident the developer can provide a calendar and an expectation. That's reasonable. And MK, I understand and Old Trail, if you asked me 15 years ago how long Old Trail is gonna take to build out, that's a multi-year process without a doubt. But we're not, we're talking about a, a, what, is this a 30, $35 million development? That should be a 24 to 36 month build out. In, in a normal, I mean, in my, in my world that I live in, like ABC should be built out fully in 36 months. That's not unreasonable from a timeline of construction availability. If you start to spread that out over 60 months or you ask the developer, how long is it gonna take you to build this? And they start to hedge on that. That should give you concern from, a, from an approval sense that either the developer doesn't know what they're doing or the developer isn't committed to building all of the phases with a reasonable timeline. They're telling you what they want you wanna hear so they can build the two or three most profitable parts and then limp into the last parts that you really want to see. I, I understand, Sean. You've, you've made your point. Liz is going to look into it with a performance agreement. Otherwise, everything you're recommending would be illegal under state law. The county would be hauled into court and we would not be found anything but guilty because of the limitations. We can only do what the General Assembly allows us to do. And the only decision we're allowed to make is in terms of land use, land use. And we can acquire perhaps some proffer agreements there and work something out. But other than that, we cannot set a timeline and say, you private industry on your property to get permitted, you're gonna to have to be doing X, Y, and Z. You want that to happen? You need to live in North Korea. You need to live in Cuba, but it's not right. going to work yeah. in a democratic So, so right, 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 by the way, it's, it's not North Korea and Cuba. It's, it's any, any oh, other like the last word on this state or, or, or jurisdiction. But Don, let's end it for this evening. We'll that's fine. Thanks, over, James. Uh, over email or some other medium. But we're, uh, you know me, I like my timeline. I go to bed at nine o'clock. It's 8.50.
Um, so we'll continue this some other time if necessary, but uh, for the time being, let's drop that and turn it over to Supervisors Palmer and Price for, uh, for their updates. Thank you. Liz, you want me to start? Um, sure, you go ahead and start because I was just finishing up my email to Greg Kampner. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you do that. Um, I will I will speak as quickly as possible, but also hopefully um, comprehensively. Last night we had a, a really good um, briefing by uh, Dr. Bonds in the Blue Ridge Health District. If you get the daily progress, much of it was covered in the front page article. The biggest issues in the past were having enough vaccinators. They solve that problem. This is not your typical shot. It requires special treatment and special handling and special injection. Um, now the issue is availability of doses of vaccines. The state, if I get my numbers correct, gets 100,000 doses a week. Our Blue Ridge Health District gets just under 3,000 a week. That's only a small percentage of the total um, that come this way because uh, hospitals get the largest share in long-term care facilities, pharmacies, and things like that. So what we've run into now is um, an expansion of the categories of individuals who are eligible for the shots, but an insufficient supply of vaccine doses to be able to inject all of the people who are now eligible. And that has been compounded by this week, opening up category 1B without an increase in the number of vaccine doses that we get. And the vaccine doses are controlled by the federal government to the state. The state then doles it out based upon population by the health district. Um, the good news is the, you know, the new administration announced they're going to use the Military Production Act, which hopefully will start to increase the supply. Another complication that came up is the CDC VAMS, that's the Vaccine Administration Medical System Network. If you are authorized to register in the system, which requires some sort of a sponsorship, basically. Once you get into the system, you have the option of trying to find a health clinic within a hundred miles radius of your home in order to get the shot. That then allowed individuals to go outside of their health district, which further complicates things because the doses are apportioned out based upon health district. And now we're running into a situation where if you register for, to get a shot in another health district and you show up there, they may cancel your appointment because you're outside of your health district. And because you had an appointment in the system, you cannot make a new appointment until that one is canceled. So if you make an appointment today for a shot at the end of February in a different health district and you show up there at the end of February and they don't give you the shot, it might be May or June before you can get the shot. So be changing the CDC VAM system to limit people more towards their health district. Um, but that's the, the long and short of it is the biggest issue right now is that we are not getting a sufficient number of doses to be able to vaccinate all of the people that we have vaccinators who are prepared and ready to provide the vaccines. We had um, the final decision on the Breezy Hill um, development. Um, it was a 3-3 tie, which meant it went down to defeat um, over there by Glenmore. I think the major takeaways from this was the importance of the master plan as it applies to the board decision. Um, I was one of those who voted against the proposal because of the density exceeded what the master plan called for and the distribution of the density within the disposal, the disposal, the proposal was inconsistent with the way the master plan um, had it that the highest density would be in the village of Ravana a little bit lower density as you go from Village of Ravana to Carroll Creek, lower density still in the Breezy Hill area till you get to Running Deer, which is the lowest density and east of Running Deer is Limestone Farm, which is under a conservation easement. Um, there are other issues with the master plan that have to be addressed. Um, there are other considerations beyond density. Um, traffic congestion is one, um, the impact on schools, environment, many other things. It was a last minute um, proffer by the developer to add um, 200,000 kilowatts um, of solar power, um, which I think everyone was encouraged to see a proffer for solar power. Um, I think the discouraging part was it was sort of a last minute add on and wasn't really um, articulated through the entire process. And so we're, I, I personally can't speak for anyone else, but I personally am hopeful 
that we will see more solar power proffers being offered but with more clarity on what they would provide. Assessments we've talked a little bit about. Um, hotels were down 23%, um, shopping centers down 22%, all other commercial um, or business properties were assessed at a reduction in value this year. The only one that was above was about 2.5%. That's a rough figure for mini storage. Um, and as we've already talked about, that was the only commercial or business property where the assessment went up. We modified an ordinance to change the date of the tax payments from the 5th of, January of June to the 25th of June to provide um, a little more time for processing of everything and also amended the ordinance so that if there is an error in an assessment based upon information that the county already has and there was no fault on the part of the taxpayer that the taxpayer can be given up to 90 days to make the payment um, whereas in before this uh, we did not have that um, ability to give um, that delay and I think the other major thing was we dealt with the outdoor storage of inert materials in light heavy industrial um, properties. Um, here we're talking about, you know, things like, you know, brick and stone and stuff that can be reused. Um, we are looking, we did require uh, some sort of a buffer um, surrounding the property, uh, minimum distances from residential areas and things like that. We don't have a lot of light or heavy industrial properties in the county. Um, and it will be impossible to fully shield from all observation the, the inert material that's stored outdoors rather than an indoor facility. Um, and especially when you get some of the equipment that's used to then produce um, into usable form. But we did see this as, a, as both an improvement in terms of the economic uh, viability of some of these industrial uses while also providing a, de a degree of protection the quiet enjoyment and visibility from other properties that might be nearby. Um, and I think those are the those are the major things that I'll cover and leave it with Liz if there are things that I missed. Thank you. Um, has everybody um, seen the, um, uh, does everybody know what got uh, uh, suggested for approval on the smart scale stuff? Has everybody seen that, the roundabout? Um, great. I uh, just want to make sure everybody did. Um, and that was some pretty good news. Of course, it's not for sure yet, but uh, uh, VDOT seems to like um, roundabouts these days. Anyway. Um, also, there's also, thank you. Um, everything that we submitted except the R cut up on 29 North um, Burnley Station um, was um, forwarded recommending approval for funding. Sorry, Liz. That's fine. I just sent out an email to just because I hadn't seen it go to the whole CAC. So I sent out an email, the uh, forwarded the email from Kevin McDermott um, right before the meeting so that everybody would have that list of stuff. Um, and um, I, I don't have much to add, seeing that it's nine o'clock also. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't know about the planning commissioners. Karen uh, said she didn't have anything. Uh, Planning Commissioner Randolph. I yield to Planning Commissioner Firehawk. Uh, Planning Commissioner Firehawk let me know in chat that she had no, uh, no further information to pass. Uh, so with that, we've got on the agenda five minutes for, uh, for closing comments. Uh, is there anything germane that anybody wants to, to bring up before we conclude the meeting? Yes, Roger. Um, I saw on the December Board of Supervisors agenda that there was a topic about addressing blight. And I was wondering if what the result of that was. There's a old store on the corner of Mill Creek Drive in 20 that's been falling down for years. And Actually, we were given, we had three options that we could take. I'll do my best to remember what they were. Um, the one we ultimately adopted was the, that CDC, the Community Development Department would send a letter to the property owners on blighted properties. Um, we cannot um, address um, unattractive or aesthetic issues, only um, blight where there's a safety issue. One of the other ones was that we could have adopted the Virginia Code on blighted property, but having done it, had we done that, we have to adopt it um, basically in full for that area. 
um, which means we don't have any flexibility. And the third one, um, I think was, shoot, was that a special, uh, like a special bill for each property? Um, I believe that a letter has been sent to the owner of the property of the store falling down at um, Mill Creek in 20, as well as I believe two others in the Scottsville district. Um, and so um, I, I provided community development with a handful of similar type properties um, as you head south towards um, James Monroe, Rolling Road, places like that. Um, I think we'll, um, we'll just have to wait and see how successful we are in addressing those. But if there are abandoned properties, I believe it's over six months, um, and there are safety issues, that's where we can go to the property owner and they either have to do some sort of repair or demolish it. Um, Liz, do you remember anything else on that? Liz, you're Liz, muted. You're um, I'm sorry, that was the board meeting I had to miss. Um, and um, so, but I will say that we've talked about this several times over the years, and it's always come down to um, the staff that would require to really deal with um, the, the blight ordinance. Um, and, you know, we, we've, made, we've made some changes in the, in the development area in recent years, but I apologize. That was a board meeting I had to miss, so I did not remember. That's right. And there was one other complication. <clears throat> there was a mechanism by which the county could, on its own, um, after legal processes followed, go through and take down the property itself. But all that allowed us to do was, would be to put, get a lien on the property. Um, and that lien would not be subject to being repaid unless or until the property is actually sold. And a lot of these properties stay in the family for many years. So it almost could be a way of encouraging the property owner to let certain properties fall into disrepair. The county does the, takes on the expense of demolishing. Um, and it, it just really, it just wasn't a, a good way for it to work out. Thank you. Albert, I think I saw your hand next. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask the supervisors about a CIP item that was uh, recently passed. There's um, the Greenways Blue Ways program was slated for $260,000 in FY21 funding. And if I recall correctly, the recent budget document uh, talked about a variety of things, maintenance, planning, uh, a number of various elements of that type of a program. I was wondering if there was any specific projects per se that was envisioned within the framework of that uh, 260,000 other than general funds that we would be dispersed over seemingly uh, for a fairly wide number of purposes. Yeah, and Rob, I was on the CIP committee with Supervisor Lapisto Kirtley, and I should be able to give you a better answer off the top of my head than I'm gonna be able to but I think part of what um, contributed to that was we had an actually a very small amount of money that we really had to work with. Um, and it was one of the ones that we could afford. And I apologize, I do not recall the, the specifics beyond that. Okay, the reason I asked because the, the email that Supervisor Palmer sent out tonight with regard to smart scale uh, mentions Fifth Street Trail Hub on the list and therefore it would seem that uh, greenways or blue greenways that might uh, interface with that trail hub would be uh, potentially a priority. So I just I wondered, was one of them. I just wondered if there's linkage between that part of the CIP that was approved now that we know that the Fifth Street Trail Hub has been approved for the smart scale. I I believe that is part of it, but Rob, again, I apologize. I, I simply can't remember the specifics on that right now. Okay, well, I'd be interested in that. Maybe you could drop me an email or share an e email with the committee. Okay, let me make a note on that. And David. Um, this may be for next meeting, uh, but if the supervisors could bring in information about um, assessments, reassessed values, um, and value changes 
per neighborhood. I heard during yesterday's presentation that the the assessor's office has reduced the number of neighborhoods um, that, that in terms of they've been combining neighborhoods. And so it would be nice to be able to know where, um, at least in our part of the county, which neighborhoods are paired with which neighborhoods when these um, reassessments occur. Because um, it, there's always uh, some, you know, we, we talk about how the numbers um, are, are, are down and lower. Um, but, but last year, um, and we may re recall this from the February meeting, um, I mentioned that our, um, ours went up uh, well over 10% and our taxes ended up, I think, over increasing over something like 16 or 18% uh, last year, our property taxes. So um, just if we can, residential, yes. Yeah, residential did go up. Um, and I saw an email today, I have not had a chance to look at it from Peter Lynch which provides at least district data. But again, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I will right. forward that to the city. And so maybe at some future date, um, the committee would actually like to hear from Peter Lynch um, mm -hmm. and talk about how they do the assessments. You might want to, because um, you know that might be something we could arrange to have him come. Yeah, I enthusiastically endorse that. And I, I promise to not talk as much next time. It was my fault, David. I, uh, I set you up a few times. <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments? I promise to also not talk too much next time. <laughs> well, our next meeting is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, February 18th at 7 p.m. Opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting will be posted at a later date in accordance with Emergency Ordinance 20 TAC Alpha 16 and open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. I move to adjourn the meeting. Bye-bye, thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the entertainment tonight. We'll see you next month. Good night, everybody.